Hi, thanks for joining me again. We're going to be talking about neutropenic sepsis today. It's a fairly quick talk, this one, but very important nonetheless. This talk is particularly aimed at people that are just starting their foundation years or anyone that's not seen neutropenic sepsis in a little while and just wants a bit of a refresher. So let's start with some definitions. So neutropenia is a neutrophil count of less than 1.5. When that count drops below 0.5, it's considered very high risk. Between 1 and 1.5, you may treat similarly to if they weren't neutropenic. 0.5 to 1, there's kind of an intermediate risk category, so you need to go very much clinically. But less than 0.5, anyone that's displaying any suggestion of sepsis, it's admission and intravenous antibiotics. So neutropenia mainly occurs in haematology, oncology, rheumatology and dermatology, but you can get neutropenic patients with most specialities and more importantly these patients may be anywhere in the hospital. Our patient populations have multiple comorbidities these days so they're not going to be restricted to particular wards most of the time. So defining neutropenia is easy enough but defining sepsis is perhaps a little more difficult just because there's so many different systems and sets of criteria. So at the moment, the trust is using the red flag system where you have a series of criteria, any of which suggest red flag sepsis, get on with doing the sepsis six. And that's on a later slide because it's still in use in the trust. There were plans to move to the news two scoring system, which is nationally approved, but um, current pandemic has got in the way of that and that system is that anyone with news of more five or more will be treated as sepsis and that is designed to catch anyone that's at risk perhaps more commonly agreed and easier to remember is um, the definition of septic shock which is systolic blood pressure of less than 90 or mean arterial pressure of less than 65 a lactate over two and the need for vasopressors to maintain perfusion. So this is internationally agreed, unlike sepsis, which uh, tends to have several different systems. So use the red flag for the time being. We'll move to the news too, probably after the pandemic. The septic shock definition will remain the same. So on with the case, it's 8 p.m. in the Osborne building. So we are gonna use a Hemont case for this one. And that's just to demonstrate some of the points I want to take away from this session. So you've got a 38 year old female. She's been driven in by her partner after she developed a temperature at home about an hour ago, 38.6 degrees. So a reasonable um, good going fever. Her background is of a diffuse large B cell lymphoma. So if your haematology is a bit rusty, it's an aggressive type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And the major point is that she's had chemotherapy recently, so about 10 days ago, and she's halfway through her treatment. Her partner says she's had diarrhea for three days, extremely common post-chemotherapy. So chemotherapy is destroying any cells which divide, and the gut mucosa from mouth right to the other end is all rapidly dividing. So mouth ulcers and diarrhea, all fair game. She has a background of Crohn's disease. No surgical intervention previously, and she's not on any medication for this, but you must bear this in mind. She looks unwell and is actively rigoring when you see her. So those unstoppable shakes along with that fever, and she's taken straight to a side room. So this is someone you need to take very seriously, very quickly. So here's our lady. And we're going to do our A to E assessment. So her airway is patent. She's talking in full sentences. Let's have a quick think about what you do for B. So her SATs are 97% on room air. Rest rate is 23. Chest is clear. And she looks generally not in any kind of respiratory distress. Heart rate is up. Blood pressure is low, fairly low, 82 over 59. She has normal heart sounds. Um, you notice that she's got an indwelling line, really important to check for lines, central lines, Hickman lines, pick lines, whatever. And we get a gas. With that blood pressure, always take a drug history and see if people have been taking any antihypertensives as well. So if someone's just taken a big dose of antihypertensives, 
that might may change how worried you are about them. So we go to D. Her GCS is normal. Pupils are equal. Blood glucose is fine, and no suggestion of meningism. Um, it's not stiff in the neck, no uh, focal neurology, and then everything else. So you're going to have a feel of her tummy. It's mildly tender. Remember, she's got this background of Crohn's, so this may be normal for her. Best person to ask about this is her. Pick site looks clean. Have a really good inspection. Make sure you can't see any erythema around the entry site, any pus, anything like that. And a quick look around for any rashes. This is her VBG. I'm going to give you a second to just have a look. So pause the, um, pause the presentation if you want to have a bit of a closer look. So remember this is a VBG, so your pH is comparable to an ABG, it's fairly close, but PO2 and PCO2 obviously are not. This is the thing I'm worried about the most, the lactate of 4, and it is quite high, this is worrying. Lactates above 2 tend to raise your alarm, especially in the query septic patient. That potassium is a bit low, have a think about why this might be. And this is uh, going to be because of her diarrhea, so very easy to leak potassium with large volume diarrhea. And that HB of 88, are we worried about this? In patients undergoing chemotherapy, not necessarily. The bone marrow is also a rapidly dividing area of cells, so it's just worth looking at the trend of their blood results. If the HB suddenly dropped, then yes, worry, but if things are on an even keel, then not so much. So what to do next? So let's have a look at the guidelines. These are taken straight out of the UHL guidelines. So the important point is in the middle, neutropenia or recent chemotherapy always should be treated as red flag sepsis. So even though in the trust general guidelines, it's meropenem first line for a query sepsis, for neutropenic sepsis, the guidelines are for tazacin as first line, unless there's a contraindication. To be honest, whatever you can get hold of quicker, if there's no tazacin around or there's a shortage, then you use meropenem. If they're penicillin, penicillin allergic, use meropenem. But the important thing is to get one broad spectrum antibiotic in. On the left hand side, we've got um, our red flags. And we've already done our ABCD assessment. So we've got a list there. I'm not going to read them out, but you can see at the bottom E is very clear. Neutropenia or chemo within six weeks, red flag sepsis. And this is just to reinforce that idea that these really do have to be taken very seriously. On the right hand side, you've got your sepsis six, which I hope has been drilled into everyone. If not, pause the lecture and just have a good look through. These are things that I hope people are doing without really having to think about it. So just have a good look through. We'll carry on. So some important points about these types of patients. So if they've got an indwelling line, you need to take cultures from the peripheral veins and from the lines. Okay, if you haven't taken blood from a line, ask one of the nursing staff to help you if they are competent to do so. Inspect the entry sites of lines. Again, this is just an important thing not to miss. If it's got a big area of pus around it, then you've found your source. That's why it's very important. You need to ask about urine output and assess their fluid status. So if someone's not peed for 12 hours, I am very, very worried at this point, and it's going to change how quickly I pick up that phone and call for help. And the key thing here, if you take nothing else away, is getting your antibiotics in as quickly as possible. So the trust guideline aim is antibiotics into patient within an hour of entering hospital. And that's not an arbitrary guideline, that's, um, that's with good reason these patients can deteriorate really fast. And I have seen patients within 20, 30 minutes drop their blood pressures down to I think 50 is the lowest I've had to deal with. So it really is important. And be strict with your fluid challenges. You must do them, must do the timings right, and you must reassess really promptly as soon as the fluid is in. So back to our lady. So you got your access. Um, what bloods would you like? I'm going to go with a full blood count, using these LFTs, CRP, inflammatory markers, um, clotting, and get your, your dual blood cultures. 
she's had one and a half grams of IV TAS through the PIC line and you've used the trust guidelines for um, bolusing so you've given her half a litre of normal saline over 15 mins. Urine dips taken and is negative but you're going to start output monitoring. Haven't put a catheter in just yet. The trust guidelines say that you should but just be sensible. If you can accurately monitor someone, you may not need to catheterize them. Remember, that's always a further source of infection, so it's a balance. As soon as someone is looking like they may need to go to ITU, then they definitely will need a catheter. Given us some IV paracetamol to try and uh, relax that fever a little bit, and ordered the x-ray. Her chest is clear, and she's not in any respiratory distress, so this wouldn't be my priority getting her into x-ray, especially if antibiotics are in but you do want to get one. And you've contacted your senior. So they're on their way and outreach should have been contacted as well with a patient like this. So after 15 minutes, you reassess the patient, bang on time, and her blood pressure's dropped to 75 over 50 and that heart rate is creeping up. What are you gonna do now? Pause the side and have a quick think about what your next actions are going to be. We'll run through some possibilities. So you could give another bolus, that's um, not a bad idea, you could add some potassium in even, try and create that potassium, not a priority, but if it's to hand, why not? You need to be thinking about the underlying source. So her chest is clear, urine dips negative, what other sources could you be thinking about? So two spring to my mind, the line could be infected, so bacteria do seem to love the plastic um, in lines and they stick to it pretty um, pretty stubbornly so it can be quite hard to get rid of the other thing to consider is could this be translocation of gut bacteria so when the gut mucosa is less um, less of a solid barrier these bacteria can make their way through and get into the bloodstream and if you think about what type of bacteria are in the gut it's usually gram negatives possible options so we're going to go with Potential for line removal with senior approval. So don't do this on your own, but this would be something to definitely consider in this patient. Addition of vancomycin to boost gram positive cover. And this is very much on the guideline and it's a sensible thing to do. If the BP is dropping, you can consider something else like an aminoglycoside. So when I mentioned before about gut translocation, gram negative sepsis is notorious for dropping that blood pressure. That's those bugs releasing massive amounts of toxins like lipopolysaccharide and causing massive venodilation. So gentamicin is the aminoglycoside of choice in the trust and is an option. This needs to be input from a senior rather than from you, but it's something that could definitely be considered. It's not on the guideline though, so be aware of that. Ameripenem should cover gram negatives. And of course, contacting ITU. That's probably going to be the go to thing here. So, your cavalry arrives 10 minutes after your second bolus has started. So, we take a quick blood pressure and it's dropping even further. So, the decision is made to remove the line and send a tip for culture. Really important to remember that bit. And a senior decision is made to give gentamicin to cover gram negatives. Seen by ITU and taken there for a couple of days, rid of inotropic support patient is ends up fine so the blood's come back an hour later neutrophils are low 0 0.18 crp is way up so this is true neutropenic sepsis two days later the line has no growth in terms of the tip growth the blood cultures however grow e coli from the peripheral and the line cultures and this shows you that this is um you know, this is from within the bloodstream and here's our picture of that troublesome little bug. So our take home messages from this, anyone with neutropenia, high risk of sepsis and septic shock. So act quickly, especially with your fluids and your antibiotics, because you will save their lives by doing this. Always consider sources of infection and routes of infection as well. Get your seniors involved early. And to read up a bit more, there's the neutropenia guideline and the sepsis guidelines, both quite useful. You can access them on the web or using the Doctor Toolbox app. Thanks for your time.